Are we all ready? Ready for more? Yes. Yeah. We have the capacity for more. Okay. And if we don't, Lord, will you uh, stretch our capacity? Right. Yes. Let's welcome Amanda this morning. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Oh, this was great fun. Wow! 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 It was awesome just to see the freedom and the joy and the celebration for our King. Amen. Wow! It's a picture. We must sing it again because I want a video. <laughs> oh, special. Okay, this morning, what I want to do with you is just. Um, gather up what where we were racing forth last night, and there were some important things that I, I uh, had to leave because of we were tired in the time. And Doug was so good to say, "Well, Amanda, let's um, you know just gather that together." And what I, w what you will see, he's going to expound on even more, and he will explain. And you know, last night when Doug was finished, and you know how tired we were. I mean, we've been going, it feels like a week already, but we've been going, and uh, when, when everything was finished, you know, Roly turned to me and he said, wow, Doug really explained it so well. And so we want to just give God the glory, Doug, you know, and um, it was such a blessing to get the bigger understanding and, and just to bring in the whole thing about what DID SRA really is about and a gl the global view of it. And my cry is, you know, the first time I heard this message, uh, my cry was that the church would hear it because you've got missionaries going out there and they can't understand, but why aren't we getting the breakthrough? Why can't we push through? and reach all the nations, but if we understand this, then we'll know how to pray more effectively. You know, so, yep. Okay, so what I want to do with us this morning, I'm just gonna quickly do a rundown of Satan's throne and the second heaven, and uh, uh, just a recap of, of what we spoke about, because we wanna get to the Neshama. We wanna understand how Neshama works. And now we, we, we're getting this, um, you know, things are becoming clear that, that, the, that the shields of, of Leviathan, and I mean, Doug was so clear last night, it's not just a crocodile. He, it's a much bigger, bigger entity. I mean, it is so big that we as human beings, you know, God says, don't try and even tackle this thing, you know, on your own. It's just, it's so huge. And what, what is shielding him is what he's stolen, from the church. And so we, we want to understand this whole thing of Neshama because that's what he's after. And so we need to know, but what is it that is so precious that God has given us called Neshama that Satan will steal it and be able to use it as shields to cover him, to hide himself. And so it's so unfair, you know, of all the torment and torture that he puts these precious people through, and then he steals that, and he uses it for himself. And so we see that um, in the second heaven, that's where the Neshama is being kept, corporately representing the bride of Satan. So it's not, you know, many times when you're working with these people that are coming out of Satanism, or, you know, obviously then you're going to go into the SRA stuff, then they say, well, I'm a bride of Satan. And every one of them is told I'm special. I'm the biggest. I have the most ranking. I have the most power because it's all a power play. You know, Lucifer, he's, he's a peacock. You know, a peacock that struts, struts himself. It's this, you know, this, the feathers that he throws out. It is this pride thing, this image of pride. And so whenever you hear the bragging of pride in the me and the I, and I will, and I will, and I will, and it's happening in the church too, my ministry and my powers, you know, I will pray for you for healing. All of that is Lucifer. Amanda, what I left out last night in Job 41, mm -hmm. you get the bottom, it says, he, Leviathan, looks on everything that is high, and he is king over all the sons of pride. Whoa, okay, there you've got it. That's a, 
Job 41:34. So it's that whole section about Leviathan, and it ends with who he is. He is the king of all the sons of the pride. And so where you see pride, and it's so easy, you know, it's part of our fallen nature, the old man, and where the pride comes in, and where, where I think, I, you know, I carry the anointing, and I should be praying for the people. You see, it sounds so spiritual, but it's so dangerous, because that is the character of Satan, of Lucifer. Okay, so um, then we looked at the web over the nations, and um, Doug was just saying, you know, if we could take that picture, and we could, ta- we could take that, it, we funnel it, you know, we put a funnel underneath all of that, and we pull it down into Satan's throne, because all of that is powering up Satan's throne. You know, Satan doesn't have power, he's got to generate it in ways that he, that from, from, from slaves and from people that he uses. And so, sorry, and the iniquity force. That is what powers him up. And so, you know, when, when we started down this journey and we started to see what the Satanists do, they'd go to electricity boxes in areas. I don't know how it works in the States. But we have these big electricity boxes in areas. And then what they would do is they, you know, Satan would use them and they would start walking backwards, anti-clockwise, around these things and they generate powers to then throw blankets over areas. So can you see they've got to generate power. They've got to do something to get the power. And because um, Satan doesn't have the power. I mean, God can just flick him off. You know, that's the, that's the power of God compared to the devil. But what he does is he abuses people and he makes slaves of people to generate power for him. Okay, so now let's understand the bloodlines. Um, I'm just going to run through it again. Revelation 16, 13, that speaks about the loathsome spirits like the frogs leaping out of, listen, the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. So we're talking about end time things. This is in Revelation 16, verse 13. And then the picture that we just put together of the 13 high council of Satan, we see there is the Satan's throne, and then, of course, always the number 13. And we started looking at where does this number 13 come from? Just a little added something for you to think about. But remember Lady Di and her accident. And she was in France, in Paris, and um, th- suddenly, uh, all the lights in Paris go down. I mean, that is not normal, okay? All the lights go out, which was the cue, the trigger for the driver who was a mind control victim. He hit the accelerator and he raced into that tunnel and he hit the 13th pillar. And so she was then stuck in the car. She was still alive. They did interviews with a paramedic that actually found her. She was fine. She was talking. Everything was fine. But she had to die, bleed to death as a sacrifice at that spot. And when they started to dig and find out what, what was the land, the original land before the bridge was there, it was a ritual site for the goddess Diana. And there she died, bleeding to death. Isn't that amazing? So you can just see everything is so well planned. When it comes to royalty, she was a sacrifice because she was ready to expose Philip. Okay, Prince Philip, who was, you know, doing... Doug's still going to share a lot with you because he was uh, threatened by Prince Philip's uh, henchmen to take him out. And so, you know, Prince Philip, um, they all all gathered together and decided because 
uh, was with, with Doug, she was in a ritual with Lady Di, and they were talking, and she was saying, but I found someone that can help us to come out. And so this was a danger point, because Diana was understanding what was going on around her, and she wanted help, she wanted to get out, and she wanted to get to Doug to get help. When she said, listen, I'm going to expose what's going on here, they had then, you know, sat around and decided they're going to, she's got to die. Two weeks later, Two weeks later she died. And so Doug had this burden on his heart for Lady Di, and he was just saying, Lord, but I could have helped her, you know, we could have helped her, and, and, and I missed it. And so this was in his heart all the time. And then I get to Germany, and uh, this young lady comes to me and starts slipping these little notes to me. She was the one that I brought to the States to stay with Doug and Laurie, and we ministered to her for two weeks. And, you know, like a, like a lot of stuff that we could deal with. And after that, we'd done a lot of follow-up with her. She couldn't fall pregnant. She so longed to have a baby. And they had done terrible things with her. She was in a surrogate family, top pastors there in Germany. And um, really uh, strong people with big churches. And she was trained in the cult to be a powerful preacher and to do signs, wonders, and miracles. She was a worship leader as well. And she said, Amanda, I could take the microphone at 18 years of age. And she got involved in the mission work as well. But she said, I could take a microphone and I had the people at my feet worshiping me. And she said, I could wave my arm and they would go flying. And it was all cult powers. She was trained to do this to be this instrument of Satan within the church. And then she said, when she found out what was going on, she put down everything. And she said, Amanda, I will not pick up a microphone again until I know that everything has been cleaned up. And she has really walked a journey. Oh, she's a, a really a special, special um, a lady. And, and, and God you know, help Doug to deal with, okay, I couldn't help Lady Di, but I could help. It was really great, you know, to walk the journey. All right, so the 13 high council of Satan, the dragon, the beast, and then the false prophet. So we're seeing revelation unfolding in front of us. And then we see there is Satan's throne right in the middle of this. He then declares himself as a king as number 13, and then we have the Black Trinity, which again is the beast and the Antichrist and the false prophet, which is the Black Trinity. So Doug will be speaking about the Black Trinity so that you understand where does this all come from and that the throne is there in Jerusalem. Satan has invested in the principles of bloodlines, so now you can understand the resistance against this teaching and why the grace teaching has so been pushed into the church. Everything is grace. God understands. You know, everything is grace. We, everything is under the blood. You don't have to repent. Just it's by grace. Everything is this grace teaching. And so that's the deception that we're not dealing with the bloodline. So that's why the church is so bound up with iniquity and Satan can actually come into the church and do what he wants to because we, we're not even trained or equipped. And so we're going to give you uh, this, this quick uh, rundown. We know that it all starts in Babylon with a king named Nimrod. And we know that he couldn't complete the tower and what you need to understand is Satan's whole aim, now in the last days, he wants to complete the tower. Because he wants that final, that plan he started with way back in Genesis, he wants to complete it now. To push, he thinks he's going to push God off the throne. And so that's his whole pl plan by getting all these SRA people and he's pulling 
on their bloodlines. So it's royal t- people from the royal bloodlines that's carrying all that, that iniquity that he can use them so powerfully to complete. He thinks he's going to complete the tower. He hasn't read the end of the book yet. And so he comes as the leopard king and he represents the first type whenever he's manifesting. It's all about Babylon uh, being established and Babylon, you know, on the, um, that is going to be like the, the final kingdom. This is what he's trying to do. Verse 9 tells us that he was a mighty hunter against the Lord. And the ancient Jewish tradition states that Shem, one of the sons of Noah, he stood up to Nimrod and killed him, and then he was cut into the 13 pieces. And then the history between the warfare between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, you've done that in Genesis 6. You've understood how it works. And the lineage of the Antichrist continues to this day, culminating with the, at the battle of Armageddon. And now we look at what happened in France. There was a lot of darkness, a lot of evil going on in this king called Charlemagne which is in English King Charles I, and he was around the 8th century. History tells us that it was during this time period that Satan decided, he started with this big plan, to regather together in Charlemagne that which was scattered through Nimrod. So those 13 pieces that Shem cut up, He's now, when it came to Charlemagne, they now, Satan comes and he says, right, we're going to get a hold of these pieces. We're going to put Nimrod back together again. And so the gathering or the reuniting of that, which represents the 13 pieces of Nimrod. And then we get to the 12th century, which is the first Holocaust. You know, there was the second Holocaust with Hitler. But there was a first Holocaust, and that was in the 12th century, and that's where Doug was telling about his bloodline, and, um, you know, that someone in his line, the priestly line, was very much part of, uh, of establishing Satan's plan in the 12th century. Charlemagne's line then became the Merovingian bloodline. Uh, where all the kings of the earth today have to prove their bloodline is from Charlemagne. So if you say, I'm a royal, you've got to prove that it, you go back to the 12th century and you come from this king, um, Charlemagne. All right, now let's get to the Druids. The Druids were very, very strong and they're still very strong today. So history tells us that Julius Caesar was the one who was instrumental in outlawing the Druidic religion because they were into the human sacrifice and doing terrible things to people. Human, they practiced human sacrifice in the Roman province of Gaul. Okay, that's in France. And the kingdom of Gaul, France and Germany had three divisions within the Druidic culture. There was religion, very strong, where they worshipped the gods, the spirits, the animals, the trees, the rocks, the mountains. Then they were a set of warriors. So they were warriors that would fight. And then they were the workers, the farmers, who would bring the food and supply the soldiers and the religious leaders with food. Druid training included many secrets and training. They were forbidden to write anything down. So how then would they carry the knowledge across? If they, it, was, it was very serious. You were not allowed to write anything down. But how did they then pass on the information? And this is the key because they're still doing this today with the SRA people. So to keep the secrets, the women were abused, conditioned, and trained to hold the secrets and the power. So the woman with the womb, the women were trained and they were the ones that kept the secrets. Through sexual rituals, these powers and knowledge were transferred. So if a king of the earth, if a leader wanted information, 
he would then have a woman come to him, have sex with him. And remember I said to you, sex isn't just body on body. Sex is body, soul, spirit. And so there's a transference of spirit information Okay, soul information that takes place when sex takes place. And so there's a download. You know, and God made marriage so amazing because Satan's a copycat. Riley, can you come stand with me? Come, come, come. <laughs> he, he doesn't know when I'm going to do these things. <laughs> no, it is. Okay, so... so so what happens is in marriage, you know what an iPod, you know what's an iPod like, you know an iPod. Um, if you want to top up your iPod, you want to update the iPod, you plug it into the computer and you sync it. Is that right? Then the same information is on, on the one, you know, from the computer to the iPod. Now, God within marriage, within the covenant, has done the same thing because Satan has now copied this to steal it. And this is how he, he d then does it in the cult. So within marriage, in the marriage covenant, Roly will have time with God, okay? And we'll be busy in the week and we, you know, the normal weekly stuff and we're running and we're busy. But each one of us, we have our quiet times before God. And we are in, enjoying the Lord. And so there comes a time that we would get together. Now the Hebrew guys, they uh, wait for Shabbat, you know. And when it's Shabbat, Friday night, that's now when it's pudding time, you know. It's, it's, it's a good time of, of unity and coming together. So what happens when a husband and a wife comes together, everything that he's received from the Lord that week, he, I'm now going to be synchronized. So there's a spiritual download of whatever Roly received in our place of intimacy and covenant. And this is the blessing of God upon marriage that Roly then downloads and, 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 and deposits into me the beauty and what God taught him. And the same with me, what God taught me, and in that place of intimacy, I download to him. And so what happens? We are now in sync. We are one. And this is the oneness of the beauty of the marriage covenant, so that we will stay together in unity and walk together with the same mind so that, you know, when there's a oneness together, there's that exponential release of anointing and flowing and praying together. And so many times women have said, but I'm under, my husband doesn't really know God, but I know God. Then I said, and then they say, but my husband's not really, you know, flowing in the things of the Lord. And I don't feel like having intimacy with him. And, you know, I have a problem. And so they kind of like pull apart. I said to you, you know what? You are, you missing the most powerful weapon God is giving you. So you need to be intimate with him. So you fill yourself up with the word. You build, you, you declare God's word and you, you pray and you fill yourself up so that when there's intimacy, you download onto your husband. And I tell you, when it's all over, he lies back and he says, Hallelujah. <laughs> God has given us some strong weapons. <laughs> and that's the beauty of marriage. Uh, there's still so many secrets I can share with you. <laughs> when we do a marriage seminar, one day I'm going to do those, those wonderful intimate things. 
but but this is the beauty of marriage and how God has put us together as husband and wife, you know. But Satan comes and he hates the covenant and he hates this that we have. And so he comes with another attack and he uses the beauty of what God has given and he makes it the most defiled. And that's why he always brings sex into the picture because he knows that there is a download. He knows that there's a transference. He uses the principles that God has put in place. And so these women are then used in sexual rituals to download to the kings of the earth. And they will then receive the secrets that is needed. Just sure. a little pause. Sure. We want to go before sure. you pass that up. Okay. Uh, every time a, a person is abducted or taken to a ritual, because the hybrids, the, the transfer of power from the kings of the earth took place in a massive ritual in 1976. One paired in, in New Swanstein Castle. We've yeah, been there in the other in Jerusalem. Yeah. So from 1976 to the present, the kings of the earth now are hybrids. So what this means is the current reigning Antichrist, these women, when they're taken to Jerusalem, they are joined with a, a, the hybrid Christ. Mm. And then a high head of state will then be joined with mm. them. Mm. So the, ru the, the human... Uh, uh, rulers now, mm. Mm. they receive an Antichrist download mm. after a cult, one cult prostitute is joined mm. to the hybrid, and then that woman is now handed over to mm. a ruler. Like Obama was a big one. I mm. mean, he was, he's fully cult involved. Mm. So is Hillary Clinton. We have ma many testimonies. Mm. So this is the context we're talking about. This download imparts the spirit of Antichrist to Dalai Lama, to Pope Francis, fully cult, okay? So I hope that doesn't pop anybody's bubble, but this is the real world, okay? <laughs> <All right>. Okay. <laughs> and so to obtain the highest ranking in Druidism, the priests of Gaul had to go to the Isle of Man. This is very interesting. Even to this day, this is, this is the, the plan, all right? This is what they do. And so if the kings of the earth, for example, it's, it's known there in South Africa, you know, that, that they do nothing until they sleep. I mean, they just have sex and the download is there and then they do whatever they have received from the hybrid son that is then standing in for the Antichrist. The sex is there, the information is downloaded. She is sent to have sex with the president's and she downloads whatever he has to do the next move in the nation. So I think what happened today with the victory that you guys have celebrated, God has overruled every plan they try to put into place. And I remember, Doug, I was here when the election, I was at your place with the election when Trump was elected. And the SRA girls were all called up to empower Hillary so that she would win. And so it was like, it's, it's just, it's going to be, she will win. And she didn't because God overthrew. And I believe it's because of the prayer and it's because of those people that are understanding how these things work and they were hitting the stuff in prayer. And so, yeah, God and doing the DID work. Amen. Amen. All right. So there's a place that if you want high ranking in Druidism, you go to the Isle of Man and you go and do your rituals there. And so Druidic secret rituals and practices are also known as the ancient secrets of Babylon. And so they're at Stonehenge where they go and do all their rituals and the, and the worship of the sun, the rising sun and the setting sun and the shadows, and there's a whole lot of stuff that happens at uh, Stonehenge. So how is Druidism, mind control, and the New World Order practiced today? Women are used in the same way as they've been used for generations. They wanted their wombs. And so all that they want is they after the woman's wombs. Men don't have a womb. The woman has the womb. And so they are sold by their hidden biological fathers to become cult prostitutes and for their wombs to produce hybrids. And Doug will share with you 
about, you know, a normal human being has got a, a double-strand DNA, but now when you're working with these precious people that now have to produce hybrids, there's a third strand that comes into play. So Doug, Doug will share more on that. The women are chosen by Satan and then powered up and conditioned throughout their lives through sexual intercourse with Satan, fallen angels, and Nephilim. They will receive secret knowledge and power, which they will then transfer to the kings of the earth. For example, the reports of where Hitler and the Nazi scientists received their very advanced knowledge from was from the Nephilim. It was quite sad when you work in Germany because Germany is like a petri dish. You know when you do um, experiments in a laboratory? It's they, Germany was like a petri dish. And they would then, you know, do all the experiments with the Second World War and they had a lot of human beings to, to work with and do those horrific things with and they knew how far they could push a human being. And what Doug was sharing was that, you know, they, they, they take them through always through a state of death because our God that we serve, you know, on a Friday night when it's, when it's Shabbat and, 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 you know, when you lift up your glass, what do you say? You know, some people say cheers. Some people, what, what, what do you guys say when you, to, you know, toast or what do you say? Cheers. cheers. You say cheers. Okay, now you know what the Hebrews... You, uh, Bandai. Bandai. Banzai. Ban, ah, okay. So, but you know what the Hebrew people say? What, what, yeah, what the Hebrew people say when they lift their glasses, Lachaim. And that means to life. Which means the God we serve always fights for life. He's pro life, our God. So that's why. Pro-life is winning, hallelujah. Okay, so we see that, um, you know, Satan's everything about death. And so when he takes these precious little babies, little babies into death, in a state of death, Doug mentioned that they, he, they would lower the temperature and they can keep them in a state of death for longer and then resuscitate them. Something else I'm just going to mention, if there's Islam, if you're working with anybody from Islam, and you want to get them free. You can break a whole lot of stuff, but there's one secret you need to know. And that is when that baby is born, the imam comes to the place where the baby has just been freshly born. And he whispers into the baby's ear an Islamic name. And it goes into the subconscious mind and they sealed. They sealed into Islam. And so many times they battle to come free because that secret word that's been that name that they received right there as a tiny baby is not ever broken or brought into the light. Okay, so then the presidential sex slaves. There is a book that was written, and it's obviously not her real name, written by a lady called Bryce Taylor. And the first book that she wrote, she wasn't born again. And um, it's called Starshine. And there she explains her husband. They were all part of cult and how she tried to come out. The second book is where she writes about being a presidential slave. And I mean, she opens up Bob Hope. She opens up a whole lot of names that she had to service. And she had to download to these top presidents. And it's called Thank You for the Memories. And it's really, when you do get that book and you do read it, please pray because it's, I mean, she's very explicit. She says it as it is. She doesn't mince words. And so just, just uh, cut yourself clean every time after you've read it so that that stuff doesn't stay with you. You know, it's really heavy. All right, through ritual sex today, women are used to transfer demonic power and information from Satan to top world leaders, the kings of the earth. Large amounts of money is exchanged when the handler, father, allows his conditioned sex slave to transfer the power and information to world leaders in the religious, political, economic sphere of influence. 
All right, so, so Doug, maybe we can also speak about the ranking. You've got the royals, these very top girls that will serve as kings. They'll only have the sex with the main guys, the kings of the earth. And then you have the sex trafficking, which is, you know, the prostitution, which is also part of the whole bigger picture. But their ranking is lower and they're just doing the dirty work and they're supplying the babies for the sacrifice. So that would be their function. All right, now we see understanding there. We've got what I did last night. We go back to Adam and the fall of man, Semiramis, Babylon, and Nimrod. Then the next, Charlemagne, which is around the 8th century. Then we have the Merovingian bloodline and the putting together of the 13 pieces of Nimrod. Then you have the Druids that are very, very strong and the whole sexual stuff that they brought in as part of the picture. Then you have the 13 top bloodlines and Satan over all the nations and the throne being in Jerusalem. Then in 1948, you have Israel that comes back. All the timing is around Israel and then the nations that come together. So there in 1948, Israel. And now today, we have the mind control and the Nephilim as it is today. So that gives you a good uh, picture and a good idea of um, just the rundown of a timeline. Now there's a demonic triangle, and Doug will be sharing also, oh sorry Doug, I'm loading you, about this, and it's Mount Hermon there in Israel. Remember with the flood and Noah, Genesis 6, where the angels came down? We've kind of back-engineered uh, to um, what is the template and the foundation for uh, women who are now conceiving uh, the quintessential hybrid that is not strange looking grays or anything like that. Their Antichrist is not going to look weird. He's going to look like a, a, the quintessential next level of evolved, if you will, species of humanity. So Adolf Hitler, uh, we could cover this, you could remind me, in Revelation 17, he is the seventh king. You, because in John's day, there was the sixth. Another will come. He must continue for a short time. He's the last human king in transition to the Antichrist, who is the eighth. It's Revelation 17, okay? The eighth. You know, the resurrected Nimrod. All right, so Nimrod, he was born a regular individual. But according to Genesis 10.8, he became a gibberim. Remember, the Nephilim are also called gibberim, the mighty champions in uh, Genesis 6.4, same word. Well, he became a gibberim. Well, you say, well, that's just a mighty man. David had mighty men in Gibberim. But the point is that Nimrod, the Antichrist, ascends out of the abyss, which is a synonym for Tartarus, where the rebellious giants were, were sent in, in Enoch. That's found in 2 Peter 2.4. So if Nimrod ascends out of the abyss, the Antichrist, how did he get there? When Nimrod died, he was no longer human. He's the first transhumanist. And the Tower of Babel is like a giant CERN. The CERN today is the replication of that tower. It is to break through and to become as gods. That, that's, that's the hidden thing behind CERN. It doesn't mean all the people at CERN understand what they're doing, but the deep occult level. Look up Anthony Patch. And he's the world most informed person on CERN. So you have that Tower of Babel as a stargate, and Babel actually means in the Babylonian, gate of the gods. Okay, so he ascended, he was, received the DNA from Satan to be the first transhumanist. In other words, the first template for an antichrist. He's killed, and by, by the way, some of the rabbis have stated that Shem was Melchizedek. Uh -huh. So that's, that, I, I'm not saying it is, but that's an interesting thought mm. that they have. So, all right, so he dies, he goes into Tartarus, that is the abyss, and he comes up out of the abyss, Revelation says, and he becomes Antichrist. Okay? So if he's killed, why doesn't he go into Sheol or Hades and wait for judgment? Because he, he's no longer human. And so I had to think of myself, okay, uh, because the word he became, a gibberim, the Hebrew word, and people make a big play on this, means to defile oneself. But the actual technical use of the hifil stem in that verb 
uh, Noah became a gardener. Well, he didn't mean he defiled himself. So I, I, I resisted that. But I had to deal with the fact that how did he end up in the abyss? So he really did become the first transhumanist or hybrid. No one since Nimrod had the qualifications to receive directly from Satan the DNA of transhumanism or Nimrod until Adolf Hitler. And since Adolf Hitler is the last human king and bridge for the Antichrist, there was a massive ritual that occurred at the end of World War II. Uh, I won't give into all the reasons why Hitler uh, is the mastermind behind generational SRIDID. There's a reason for this, and maybe we could talk about it another time. But he qualified to receive the DNA of Nimrod in a massive ritual that occurred in Jerusalem. And in this ritual, Satan gave him the DNA of Nimrod because he qualified. He killed X number of his own people. He qualified because of the iniquity force of being behind the, the, the death of six million Jews. He qualified. He was able to meet the satanic criteria to receive the download and template for the current Antichrist. So in that conception ritual that occurred in 1944, it's interesting that all the women conceived in 1944. Now what are you going to do with that? <laughs> This is craziness, right? Not if you understand. You can go on the internet. When, uh, how, how viable is a, as a frozen embryo before it can be implanted and, uh, and become a child? Well, they, on the internet, you, you, I think you at least find 20 plus years. They developed a way of put these, all these women that are, the, uh, that are in the resource pool to bring forth Antichrist, they were conceived at the same time. And the DNA of Nimrod is, is incorporated with the DNA of King George VI, who is the a bloodline that takes us right back to Nimrod, is a convergence of DNA protocol to produce Antichrist. So these women are templated at conception to be able to, to conceive a hybrid, because it's abnormal. That's when the third strand, the triple helix, is in, in, installed. You can't see it, but it's there. It's functional. All right, so all the women that are produced hybrids are conceived of what I found at the same time. And the, the deepest level of their identity is Ava. I am the wife of Hitler. And I am, I am here to bring forth children for him. Uh, and ultimately, the convergence of that is Antichrist, which is the German, German Ubermensch. Mm -hmm. So these women are implanted at different stages and in, in different venues uh, because Satan doesn't know which woman will produce the actual quintessential that will result in the Antichrist himself? And we have all the evidence now that he's, he's already here. He's just hidden. He can't be released yet because there's a restrainer on him. Second Thessalonians 2. So this is a massive project. It is satanically engineered. And I, and I can say emphatically that the father of generational SRADID in the body of Christ was inspired directly by Satan, and, get, and that whole project was given to Adolf Hitler, and Mengele was, is the one he used to implement the program. So there's a lot there, but there's a lot of history, a lot of cooperative testimony that converges on this. This isn't, this isn't come from me. This comes from different people from all, all over the world, primarily uh, Europe and South Africa and America. Okay. okay and so in, when, when uh, Genesis 6, where the angels came down on Mount Hermon, that was the portal. And then we know that the flood came. And then in 19, when was that portal opened again? In 1944. 1944, at Mount Hermon, the portal was reopened. Why? Because there was enough blood. There was enough iniquity of all the Jews that were killed. And so that portal opened again over Mount Hermon. And again, the fallen angels came down and he, they did work with the kings of the earth and in preparing the woman to have that third DNA strand, the triple helix, to be able to conceive hybrids. So it's not everybody that can now conceive a hybrid, okay? It's those, the, the, the royals that came through and um, at, at Mount Hermon. That they must be templated. 
Okay, so there must be a structure. Then we have, look at the demonic triangle. You've got the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, all right, where all things are happening underneath there. You've got Mount Hermon, and you've got Golgotha. This is the demonic triangle. So there's a lot of memories that come forward from the survivors around this demonic triangle. And then we have, from Golgotha, there's a portal to Tartarus where you've got the angels have been kept, those that were disobedient. And the book of Enoch says that 200 angels were there and kept in captivity. To understand Tartarus, we know from scholars, and, and I've checked this out, Tartarus is a synonym for the abyss. The abyss, the abyss is open. Okay, See, that's okay. so where you read in the word about the abyss, then um, it's uh, to Tartarus. Okay. Mount Hermon, let's have a look just at a couple of things around Mount Hermon. And this is where the watchers descended. Um, it's interesting that the whole aerial outline of Mount Hermon is in the form of this goat head. And it's also known as the territory of the goat god Pan. You know, the goat god that would play the flute and Mount Hermon is where the watchers descended. It's the entrance to Hades. It's the grotto of Pan, and it's the fortress of Nimrod. One of our prayer leaders, who's been doing a lot of prayer work for many, many years, she's in her 60s, and she went, uh, she took, did a study of where all the giant nations, you know, of Genesis 6, uh, went to all over the world, and she went to pray with a team um, around all of those things. And she said they got to Israel, and they drove past uh, Mount Hermon. And she looked at Mount Hermon, and she just spoke, and she said, um, I'm watching you. That's all she said, but that's arrogance. She said immediately there was total confusion in, in the car that they were driving in. Nobody knew who they were or where they were going. It was such a hit. And she realized she'd stepped out of ranking. She'd stepped out on her own. And she was arrogant. And she should never have challenged. You don't, that's what Doug was saying. You know, you, this is such high level stuff. You don't play with this stuff or you know, take chances and say, well, you know, um, the Rambo. But she, she immediately realized she'd stepped out of ranking and she repented and asked forgiveness. And she says immediately the order came and they were just pulled back under the protection of the Lord. And that's how strong those things are. So, you know, be very careful around um, these principalities and powers. So, Something else I want to show you is our prayer journey that we did in Germany. And these are just pictures, just so to give you an idea. And this is, uh, there's a Battle of Nations monument there in Leipzig in Germany. Can you see those figures? Do you see the figures? Now those are the Nephilim. All right, those are the Nephilim. You've got the fallen angels at the back with the big eyes and the Nephilim standing in the front. These figures are huge, huge. So we went there with a the team, Doug, and um, we went to pray there. It was, it was a powerful time. This is also, there's the guy sitting at the top. This is when you, as you're looking up in this temple. This is Michael. Now, this is the fallen angel Michael. There's the true Michael, who's the guardian over Israel. And so Germany goes, and they claim for themselves a Michael, who is now called their guardian, but he's a fallen angel. And he stands in front. He's a huge, huge figure. Do you know how uh, Germany adopted Michael? Well, since... The Jews crucified Jesus. They no longer qualify to be God's chosen people. So that would be the amillennial, the, the denial. So the church replaces uh, the Jews. 
And so, since the, Michael no longer has a place, since the Jews are no longer God's people, Germany adopted Michael to be their guardian prince. Mm. But he's the fallen angel, Michael. The Teutonic Knights, look at behind is the fallen angel. Look at the size. That's just the face. And then you have the Nephilim in the front. They're huge, huge figures. Oh, this is the castle where many rituals have taken place. We've been there, and uh, wow, this was part of our journey, and this is where they did the crowning of King George VII. And major, major things that took place there, okay? Th a three-week ceremony. 1976, this took place there. And then this is also a place on the island of uh, Lake Constance, and those three figures are there, and when they come from Fellowship of Doug, when they stood there, they were triggered. As they stood there, as little children, they were drowned right there at those, at those statues. It was like you could see something was deep happening within them. And this was interesting. They say if you look up, okay, there's like a galley. Now I'm going to take it from the top. Down. There you see it from the top down. And that gully would be filled with blood when they did the rituals. I mean, it just blows your mind. Can you imagine how much death to bring so much blood that it ran down like a river? And this is the goddess, Constance. In her hands, she's got two figurines. She's got the church in the one hand and the kings in the other hand. So look at the power. Can you see the control of the world? And there is its close-up. A king in the one hand and the church in the other hand. Huge, huge figurine. Very sexual. And now we want to know what do Nephilim look like today. So I've got some pictures because one night there in Germany I had a, an experience where um, we'd finished the journey, we'd finished the prayer trip, and Doug, um, they were ready to leave four o'clock the next morning. And I was preparing because I had to carry on ministering the weekend. I had a conference there. So I was, I was preparing my slides till after 12. And we're staying in this big hall, like a youth center, where the shower, there's rows of showers and rows of toilets. And basins. And so 12 o'clock, I finish with my preparation and I take my towel and I walk down this long dark passage and I go to the bathroom and I hear somebody showering. And I'm, I know it's a male. I know in my spirit this man. And I'm thinking, why is Doug all showering now? You know, it just doesn't make sense. And so I decided, you know, shrugged it off went into the shower, had my shower, and as I opened the door, the guy was next to me and he opened the door. And he was this young man and he was bare-chested and he had a towel around him and I smelt the aftershave that he'd put on. And he looked at me and in German he said, good evening. And I answered him and I said, good evening. But I'm puzzled because as far as I know, we're the only people staying up there. So who is he? And I'm thinking, is it a student? You know? And, and, and then he walks across the room towards where Doug and them, where their rooms are, and to go down, the steps are this way. But he walks that way. So I'm puzzled. But I still don't understand what's going on. So we go through the conference. Actually, the next morning, I had a knock at the door, four o'clock. And I'm thinking, why is Doug coming to say goodbye again? <laughs> don't understand this. And my doors open. The next morning, my team get up and they see my doors open. And they know that, you know, I'd prepared till late, so who'd open my door? And it was all puzzling. You know, we just didn't understand. So Sunday afternoon, I get the call on my cell phone, 
And it's Doug from the States saying, Amanda, I've got to talk to you. A ritual went down on that night because one of the ladies, her Nephilim son, was in the castle. Well, I tell you, I went ice cold. <laughs> and I realized this guy that I saw showering next to me was a Nephilim. And he was very normal. So she sends me a lookalike picture of what he looked like. And this is, this is what he looked like. Just remember it's a lookalike, okay? But this is what he looked like. Very normal. But a beautiful guy... The superior guy, transhumanism, the one that Hitler was after, the Ubermensch, the super guy. Now, what happened in Germany with what Hitler did continued in South Africa. And that same spirit of, a, of, of, of being better than and superior came over to South Africa, and that's where apartheid came from. And that's where all our pain and all our sadness and now the farmers are being murdered. It's still the same spirit. Because the apartheid, those leaders, were, they went to fetch the Olympic flame. In 1936, they went to Germany and fetched Zeus' flame and brought it to South Africa. And we have a baby monument, the same monument that's that I've just shown you now, standing in South Africa. It's a Freemason monument to worship of the sun. And so now we have, you, do you know that it was Sodomites that planned the Holocaust? These guys, Hitler and all, all the top leaders, they were Sodomites because they believed in the Spartan religion. And that was, you know, these big muscle men, these strong guys. But they also believed if you sleep with a woman, you become f feminized. So that's why they had the junior Nazis, the young boys, that they would sleep with to get male power, to be warriors. So do you understand where this has come from? You can read a book called The Pink Swastika. It's all there. All the pictures are there. In a gay bar, in a sodomite bar, they made the plans for the Holocaust. In South Africa today, with the generations coming down, we have young boys, many of them, coming out of the closet, full-blown gay. And the people can't understand because it's in the bloodline. It's because of the sins of the fathers that came through with apartheid and what they were doing, they were getting their power from sodomy. The powers of sodomy, which is what the fallen angels taught them to do. So from Genesis 6, in the days of Noah, when, remember when Noah got drunk, and there were the three sons. Two of the boys covered their father's nakedness. But one of the sons... He exposed him, and the rabbis say he had sexual intercourse with him. That was sodomy. He sodomized his own father. And then we know that from there, Ham and the next generation, and Nimrod came out of that line. And so you can just see the evilness of how things have come down the generations and how sodomy has played a role. And when I did the research on your island, I saw that it was very natural. It's part of your culture that sodomy takes place. And so I wrote a book, you know, in South Africa, there was no law against sodomy. In the courts of law, if the person was now being accused of vaginal sex, I worked in prison. I knew the sentences. These guys would get up to 15 years for rape, vaginal rape. But if it was sodomite, if it was a sodomy rape, they may get a month. It was just scrapped. There was no law. And we started to cry out and say, God, this isn't right. 
And so I, I, we, you know, we got as a team together and we said, Lord, we're going to push. We're going to push. This is not justice. This is not godly justice. We need to cry out before you to bring righteousness and ju- your plumb line into our government. So I wrote a book called Sodomy. And to explain the curses that come when there's sodomy and women get sodomized, it's not just men. Women get sodomized, children get sodomized. So what is the curse? You know, it was so interesting. I was ministering with a group there in Germany. And this woman, she's a senior woman. And she'd been in ministry her whole life. And she had come to, to ask me if I would come and minister in their area of the world. And I, that was the, the appointment we had. And I said to her, how was the conference? Because we just had the conference and we had, you know, we had a couple of appointments afterwards. And she said, it was, it was great. But you know, Amanda, I had this voice in my head swearing at God the whole time. I was struggling. And I had this voice swearing and saying, I mustn't come to the conference. She's a leader. She's a spiritual leader, strong in ministry. And then she said, and then you know what a strange thing happened? I remembered that I had dreams as a child where I was being picked up by a UFO. And I had to try and protect my little brothers because the UFO was coming to fetch us. And I looked at her. And I said to her, you know what this means. And she just broke down and she started to weep. Because deep down she knew something's wrong. But you know the denial? No, I don't want to go there. No, 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 I don't want to go there. And the next moment, she dropped on her hands and knees. She went into a memory. She dropped on her hands and knees like a doggy ready to be sodomized. And, you know, I was learning, and so I was ready to, you know, bind and rebuke in, you know, the warfare. And he said, wait, Amanda, she's in a memory. She's remembering being sodomized. And she was part of Joseph Mengler because that's what he would do. He would create a beast in them put them in cages, naked, dirty, lower than an animal. You know, our human minds cannot comprehend how they were degraded, how, what he did. And here she is, this lady, nearly 70 years old, in ministry her whole life, now having to face this. She's been... My team has been walking a journey with her, but I'm telling you, what a shock. What a shock. And then what you need to know is this sodomy thing is very, very real. Because what they do, is it okay if I share a little bit explicit with you? But what they do is they, they would take this little child and then they would separate the vagina and the anus from each other and the anus pain with a principality that would then you know work with the anus side it'll be a whole structure of its own and that would be pain it's the domain the destroyer apollyon the beast okay then vagina will be pleasure and that's nimrod and so now you've got within this little one the dividedness of the sodomy, the pain, the pain and the pleasure. And then they would take the penis and they would choke the little one and do oral sex. And that's how they choke them to death. And so when they start remembering, these little ones start coughing and coughing because they're being choked because of the penis in the mouth, and they have to swallow daddy's milk, they call it. 
And so this is, this is the reality of, of how awful these things, and they do this over and over and over with these children. That is what they do. They call it three-way sex. And I know this is heavy, so you don't walk into this unless you're willing to go where Jesus is suffering. But right at new birth, they draw the heart out as early as possible. Do you love Jesus? They read scriptures. They read John. Bengal would draw them out, read John. You're ready? You're ready? Open your heart to Jesus. And as soon as that would happen, if it's a girl, it, this is what would happen to them. So right there, when the heart first opens to Jesus, new birth identity or that first heart connection with Jesus, it's taken into this three-way pain, pleasure, and then choked to death and sealed. This is really bad stuff. Hmm. And no one could hate it more than I do or people that have seen it. So to walk in there, you're going there where Jesus is. That's where he is. So it's not a pretty place, but he is waiting for people to be willing to share in his suffering. And maybe we can talk about that at another yeah. time. Yeah. Okay, so what I want to tell you what happened in South Africa. So I released the book on sodomy. Because you see in the prison, the first thing they do with the guys is they do gang rape. So that means how many guys, some of the men die right there because it's too much. And so it, it's a huge thing in South Africa. And then I wrote the book and we released it in through prayer and intercession and crying out to God. I released the book in August. December, the law changed. The law changed. So you can change government laws by crying out to God for justice and righteousness to prevail. And so this is real stuff. Another picture that you can look at is a lookalike there. Some, one of the survivors sent this one and said, this is what my Nephilim son looked like. Beautiful. Beautiful. And then... You have also a little boy that someone also sent me and said, well, this is what my Nephilim that they had. And then, of course, he grows up. Now, just to explain to you how it happens is that as, as, as a, a, a little baby girl, she gets the ability to have to produce a Nephilim. Now, remember, Babylon is the copycat, all right? So you have a fallen angel that is overseeing this process with Satan. So you've got this little girl, and now when she gets born, this fallen angel is overseeing the whole process, making sure that the plan of Satan will come into fulfillment. That same fallen angel will watch and do the rituals and do all the terrible things with the child. And as the child grows up and she gets to the age of 12, 13, now her period starts. She starts the womb, is now able to give birth. Then that fallen angel comes in the form of the, the, that will have sex with her and just like the story of Semiramis and Tammuz, that fallen angel, that, that Nimrod becomes Tammuz. So the same story with her as a little girl, that fallen angel becomes the Nephilim. Are you with me? So it's the sex, and now, be, now she becomes a Mary that is going to give birth to a Jesus, the Antichrist. And so you see that that's the pattern, it's Babylon. And so when she gives birth to this, then this child grows up very quickly. So she's 13, age 13 is very important. And then when she turns 26, this Nephilim that she's given birth to, her son, is now this beautiful young man, and she marries him, and now she becomes the wife. 
So way back at 13, she becomes the mother. She gives birth, the fallen angel has now become flesh. The same as Mary, where Jesus became flesh. So you, you see the copycat? So now she, she conceives and she gives birth to this half God, half human being, this Nephilim, mother. She's mother. And mother bonds are very strong. And so they will fight for their son. They'll do anything for their son. Then this Nephilim grows up. And by age 26, she marries him. And she's now a wife. And these bonds, very strong bonds, she's now the wife of the son. And she's sexually so addicted. This is the strongest bond to break, is the sexual addiction. Because he, he gives this amazing sex and, and she can't stay away from him. And, and, and this is where a lot of the power is taking place because he downloads to her what she needs to then give to a king of the earth. And so this is then the marriage that she has at 26. Now she's mother. Now we move on. At 39, she has another hybrid so remember the ages now. We're talking in 13s, okay? Nimrod, 13. So remember, 13 years old, 20, there is mother, here's wife. Now we move on to 39. She has another hybrid. And there's a ceiling. Every time at these ages, there's a ceiling that takes place at 39. Then we move on, which is the next one? 52. Now that's the fourth seal. She has another hybrid and the fourth seal. So by the time she's 65, she has five seals, which is the demonic grace number five of Satan. And she becomes the fullness of the demonic grace of Satan. That is why it is much more difficult to get the old people free because they have so many seals upon them. And at the age of 65, then her hybrid son will be sacrificed and there'll be a seal, the one she had at 52. That's the last baby she will have. And then at 65, that final seal comes upon her. Now she is in a position of such power and she then will train the younger girls. She will be like the matron over the younger girls and control them and, and make sure that from generation to generation, these things continue in the world. Are you getting the idea? All right, so remember, this is the false Christ. It starts with the fallen angel watching over this child with all the iniquity. All right? And then at birth, when this little baby gets born, they do three-way sex. They take her into death at birth. Then at new birth, when they lead her to Jesus, now she's got a spiritual umbilical cord connected to Jesus. Okay? The life of God. Because now, remember the glory that when, when, when man sinned, they lost the glory. So when they accept Jesus, the glory comes back. And there's the light. And that's what they're after. Because those are the shields that Leviathan uses to cover himself. And so now this little one has accepted Jesus. Immediately, again, the three-way sex. And they wrap that new birth identity. The light of God. That which belongs to Almighty God gets wrapped up in death layers of death then so this is this is huge because in therapy you always have to go back to the new birth identity where the light of God came in in the first the first place but they make sure that they wrap that part up in death in death in death and make it very dark. And we, as the, as the Christians, as the therapists that are praying with them, we want to find the light. 
We want to find the light, the original little girl that gave her heart to Jesus. Where is that little girl? Because it's from there. That's the anchor. That's the, that's the main thing that we need to get. That's Nishama. Okay, that light. And so there at new birth, there again, the, the three-way sex and wrapped up in death. Now, let's move on to 13. Now the 13-year-old, they, they've hurt her. They've tortured her. She's angry. She hates God. And so she now, she's, she's now got the freedom to make a choice because she's now old enough that her, she, she goes through the rites of passage, which is a Hebrew tradition of at 13, uh, you go through a, a ceremony, a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah, where it's the rites of passage, where, you, where you're now an adult, and you can make choices and you stand accountable before God. So now at 13, when she now is, is giving birth to this very, she's now mother, she looks back at that little one who gave her heart to Jesus, and she says, you know what? I now agree she must stay dead. So this 13-year-old is a big key that we need to understand. And then from the 13, we go on to the 26th marriage. Now she's now wife. And then 39, and then 52, and then 65. So please remember this is just to help you to understand, you know, how these things work. Now, I want to take you three last slides and then we break. Zedekiah's cave. This is under the Temple Mount. And there is a plaque that says the Freemasons Hall. And it says that King Solomon was the first biblical Freemason. Have you ever heard of anything like that? Like biblical yoga, you know, or biblical... <laughs> We're trying to Christianize and hijack. So, so here we see the Freemason Hall and everything here in the cave. Now, we were in Jerusalem. This lady that's got the prayer house says to us, Amanda, I want you to meet this um, uh, Arab. There's this Arab that's given his heart to Jesus. He's working in the cave. So he wants to show you that he found a ritual, um, the remains of a ritual in the cave. But we're going to go there when the public don't go. We're going to go there on our own, and we're going to go behind the cords where they say only the public can go up to. You know, you're blocked. We're going to go with him with his flashlight, and we're going to go and see. So this is what happened. We got right into the very back of the cave, and it was deep, deep. We went far in, almost like under the Temple Mount. You know, we went in from Zedekiah's cave as we moved in, deep, deep, deep under the rock. It was cool. It was cold in there. And we found this hole. And this guy said to us, listen, there's funny noises coming out of this hole. Now, I had not met Doug. I knew nothing of this stuff. And so these noises coming out of this hole, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a scary place. And he said he just felt he wanted to get away because there's something very strange and evil happening here. What we also found was there's the table and the chairs of where the New World Order would meet and where they would make some very dark plans. And so, you know, also not knowing what I'm doing, I take a bottle of oil and I start anointing all of these things. <laughs> okay, you can just see that cave, very dark. Okay, I'm going to stop here. But what happened was that um, when, when I got to Doug and I heard their story, one of the guys that Doug's been working with, he was a little boy and he was hung on a bungee um, elastic. And part of his punishment was he was held by his little feet and he was dropped into that hole. And he said nobody had ever shown him in his adult life when he had the memory that there was really a hole. So this was the proof 
that what he was remembering was real. I was there. I was at the hole. And they would hang him there on this elastic and they would drop him into this hole and he'd go down and bump his head and come up and bump his head and come up. And this was part of the splitting in this dark, dark place and trauma for this little child. And so it's there under the Temple Mount where the babies get born, where these Nephilim babies get born. And so people tell many stories about what's going on there. Why Jerusalem? Because Satan knows Jesus said he's going to come back to Jerusalem. And Jesus said that his headquarters is Jerusalem. So that's why he's gone and positioned himself. And he, the seat of Pergamum, you know the Bible talks about the, the throne of Satan? It was in Greece with Zeus, then it went to Berlin, there is a replica of the throne of Satan. Now it's moved to Jerusalem because that is where the big fight will be. That's the Armageddon. That's going to be the big warfare. I know this has been hard and I know it's been a difficult journey. But I really trust that you've learned some things and Doug will expound more and explain more. If you don't understand everything, just, just say, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm giving it to you and I'm holding it. And one day you will explain more. One day we'll understand. All we know is this is truly end times. We're really in the end time battle. And so I really encourage you that... Um, you know, if some of it's gone over your head, it's okay. Because in the beginning, I mean, it, a lot went over my head. I didn't understand it. But by God's grace, we're slowly, slowly getting to understand the truth. And may the Lord bless you. And may he, you know, expand. Take the ten pegs of your spirit man and stretch so that you can take in more and understand. Amen. Thank you. That was great. Um, wow. I, I, I'm, I'm blessed. Um, you know, for, I, I think many of you, you know, during the services and things, we would kind of talk about some things, but um, we didn't feel it was time to open up things to you. And I asked you to, you need to just trust, trust us. You know uh, with what's going on um, and um, so what Amanda and Doug's been sharing um, I want to say it's not like they told us and then we followed it we were walking in things and we had all these pieces and when Doug and now Amanda uh, came and walked alongside us they brought a lot of clarity to the pieces that we were missing, I mean, or trying to understand. And I want to say, every things that they've been sharing, um, we've walked that. And I know to many people, because it just, it's not their grid and, and their reality. It's like, they're just crazy, that's not happening. You know, kind of, and these judgments. Everything that they shared, they, they've told us about it before we got confirmation from them. Um, and you know, I, I, when I, I admit when I first heard things, I struggled um, to, I believed them, yet I struggled with, it's like, you're like, well, how can all this happen? And one of the most, probably most prideful, offensive thing is how could it happen to me? Or in our church, or I know these people, how could that be happening? And it's so easy to go into denial instead of trying to understand more so to, to be able to accept it. You know, um, you know I heard about um, the Clintons and the Pope and even some of the well-known Christian leaders that I think if I mentioned, you would have just accepted them. And I struggled with that too, but after a while I just realized and when Doug guys came and they added 
um, confirmation to what was being told, and I was like, oh my goodness. And now I just accept it, you know? Um, and I think it's good for us. Uh, you know, when we talked about things, I, I, you know, Amanda, I know it was very graphic, but I think it was needed to be said about the three-way rape mm -hmm. and things like that to understand, you know, and that's why when, when we said we have two miracle daughters here, you understand it's a miracle. Mm -hmm. it's, it really is. And it's not only a miracle for us, I think that's Carrie and mine and the staff um, why would God entrust us with them? And many people left because they either were a part of this thing or they didn't want to accept it. They are conditioned to believe that if they ever come out with this kind of stuff, they will, they will be declared crazy, they'll be locked up, and no one will believe them. That's true. Yeah. And um, so thank you. I know even them, as they were listening, they were struggling because they remember <laughs> these things that happened to them. Um, and yeah, and um, you, know, you know the investment, you can hear how much they invested mm. into them. Well, you don't just let them walk away. Mm. You don't, because there's so much, it's money too invested. Mm time invested mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. Doug added a piece last night that you can't just make another person because it takes time to do all this and that's why for us you might have thought what are we doing we're just scared or we're you know and some of the people use that excuse ah uh, they're just fearful you know we're, we're no we weren't we were never fearful we may have been immature in how to walk it out I was watching you, I was kind of inside, I thought, wow, I saw the maturity of our staff to the place they had come, and then I saw you guys looking like how the staff was when this first thing all came out. You know, the learning curve, right? We're on this learning curve. So, um, you know, I want to thank you too, yeah. Remember Wednesday night, uh, I was sharing about skepticism and denial and doubt. I want to encourage you now, after a morning like this, if you are suffering from denial, don't be condemned. It's only the accuser that will condemn you. Because mm -hmm. you can get knocked out of the race through denial. I mean, through the condemnation and the guilt and shame you feel around having it. Denial, they say, psychologically, is the first line of defense. Your mind naturally defends mm -hmm. itself against this. That's how we are made. This level of evil isn't a common everyday occurrence for most of us. So you hear it and without choosing you have denial. It is not a choice. I still from time to time will enter into denial. And it's usually after some other huge memory comes up and more, not just information, but more reality, and I, it's too much for me. And it might depend on where I am, like emotionally, spiritually, I'm tired, I'm vulnerable, and I have denial. And, and I'll say to Doug, what am I supposed to do with all this? Really, where do we put it? Where do we go with it? What do we do? And he said something to me, this was a few years ago, because we were going through a phase where the father was changing. Every, every week it was, oh no, this is my father, this is my father, you know. And then it finally settled. So it's like, okay, now, now wait a minute. I mean, how am I supposed to believe this, you know? But that's when I said, what am I supposed to do with all this? And he said, you're not responsible to do anything with it. And that was freedom for me. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, didn't, I don't have to figure it out. I know when we hear this, it's just like Satan to do this. It, it's really, isn't it? It's according to his character and nature. It makes sense. 
but it doesn't mean that my mind can grasp it. I think it's more grasped yeah. in the spirit okay. where you are joined with the Lord who knows everything. Yeah. So, so I just wanted to say it before we take a break. Satan would want you alienated from mm. these folks, uh, from those who understand, from Doug, Amanda, myself, Rolly, um, and, and even just amongst your own brethren. So give yourself grace. Give others grace. And another thing that helped me through the years. Because until the end of the journey, until there's full integration, there is doubt in these folks. There's denial. It's protection, mm -hmm. isn't there? There's still denial. It's still like mm -hmm. they'll come maybe into a whole new level of knowing. And, and, and they'll wake up one day and say, I may, I'm making all this up. So I say, if they who went through it have denial, it's okay if I do. Yeah. Yeah. I and, didn't go through it, so yeah. why not? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but, but eventually as you rest in the Lord, remember the works of God aren't accomplished by the flesh. They're not accomplished by the mind. I mean, the work of God is done in the Spirit, by means of the Spirit, by means of His power and authority. And so, who are we? We are mere humans, but in union with the Lord Jesus Christ, who, is, who knows all things. He knows it all. He, walked, he never left him. He walked all the way through, took the brunt of it. Um, so he's the one that we're depending on, and that's really what it's all about, is dependence upon him. And, and that's the real wonderful gift mm -hmm. that God gives us as we journey with the wounded, is we grow in dependence, in humility, and there's more I'm going to share. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, but I just want to say that before lunch, before we break, just... Stand against the accuser if you, if you are being accused in your mind, if you are just reeling and wanting to push away, wanting to deny. How, how many of you have been a Christian for longer than 10 years? Raise your hand. So it's everybody here. How many of you now feel, or at least feel, man, what have I been doing in the last 10 years? Yeah, yeah. Welcome to the club. That's right. Right here. Welcome. That's how we felt. We're like, and, and you know, I, I'll guarantee you, you cannot go back to church how it was. Try to think about it. So the, the, what do you go back to? Yeah, what do you go back to? You know, Jesus tricked us, you remember? He, he did all the miracles, he fed them, he taught them, they all followed him. And John 6, he turns around and he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood kind of thing. And they're like, we came too far, <laughs> like, where, where are we going to go? And I'm, I'm excited because I ask that not to make you feel condemned, but to make, I, I'm blessed to see what the Lord is doing. He's opening your eyes. He is. And we're not going to be the same church after this. You know, and that's why some of you heard, um, while well, we're a cult. You're in a cult, right? And Doug was like, well, welcome to the club. I'm like, that's our badge of approval. I mean, because churches will not talk about this. Honestly, either they're ignorant or they don't want to know. And then if you do, just like how when they share, it's not believed. When you share, they're not going to believe you either. Yeah. And John was named a false teacher. I said, praise God, you're a real teacher now. <laughs> Before, I was worried about him, you know. Everybody <laughs> liked him. <laughs> no, but yeah, um, I'm glad because we... we, we we're moving forward. We need to move forward. And, yeah. and I'm glad that you, you're getting now through them what we got. So it took us a while to process. So be gracious to yourself too. Be gracious, gracious, gracious to each other. But, but man, probably you've got to be the most graceful to yourself first. Okay? You're not stupid. You're not dumb. You know, it's just part of the learning curve. Yeah, I just feel like God's grace and, um, you know, now we're 
able to find out what God was doing as we were walking this out. And I just wanted to um, you know, share that, um, I mean, Amanda, as you were speaking, um, I know our two girls were just, you know, um, tearing and got a little emotional. But um, they kind of told me that um, it made it very personal for them because they've heard recordings, and we have too, yeah, a little recording. But there's something about when when we're face to face and spirit to spirit and heart to heart, hearing um, the stories and truth. And so I feel for them, it's um, the Lord's just taking their healing because they're like, you know, someone's talking about my life, and it just becomes more true because that's what they battle, you know. They're still integrating. So there's, there, there's times like, is this still really true? Am I, am I free? Am I, you know, even the body, is, it, is this body safe? And that's what we talked about because they're, you know, to remember too, um, as I guess, Amanda, you were talking about the hybrid sun, it brings up a lot of memories for them and emotions. And, and so the courage to stay here and what I mean by not escape or put up walls of denial um, I'm so proud of the two girls today yeah really just um, them be allowing the Lord to strengthen them to stay and, present and, and remember yeah. what Doug said because mm -hmm. part of the conditioning mm -hmm. is you don't talk about this yeah. you don't expose it right so typically, there'll be re there would have been retaliation and yeah. things for all this. God did not intend us to know this level of evil. When man chose to eat of the knowledge of the good and evil, he stepped out of that which was not originally intended by God. So we are coming into that which is, we were not designed to even know this kind of stuff. But if we choose to be a... Uh, a collective family to validate you're being here you're validating then you're choosing to come into Jesus's sufferings you're gonna share his sufferings I might know him and the power of his resurrection even fellowship of his sufferings by being conformed to his death this hearing this is a fellowship of his sufferings he, he's there. It's not that he just knows this. He's in it in these people. And he's waiting for those that would be willing to choose to be in fellowship with him in his sufferings. That then they're, they're coming out into life. Because he chose to allow this to happen. And so we wait long enough and endure long enough. The last attribute of divine love is love endures all things, perseveres. So out of it comes resurrection. So this is not, all this is not the end. We go into the fellowship of Christ's sufferings and God's purpose is to bring us into oneness with the sufferings of Christ so that we can come into higher levels and dimensions of resurrection union with Jesus Christ. Now I want to tell you something. The death of Christ on the cross, he, there's two things. He died for our sins. That's the atonement. But as the last Adam, he died as us and for us. So the blood of Christ deals with sins. The cross deals with sin singular, which is the root. Okay? So as we, as we go into death, as the old man progressively dies, it capacitates us to come more onto resurrection ground. So the cross and death union with Christ is victory over sin. The blood is, deals with sins, but the cross deals with sin. So the, to the degree that we're conformed to his death and come on to resurrection ground, there's victory over sin and over self. But what about the ascension and the resurrection? The measure in which we are coming into ascension union with Christ on the ground of resurrection is victory over principalities and powers. It's ascension union with Christ that gives the authority uh, over these powers. If you've never read the little book In Christ by T. Austin Sparks, you can go online. It's called In Christ. 
chapter 4, he talks about ascension union and ascension faith. It'll be a big booster for something like this. Thank you. You know, we've been, I've been doing deliverance a long time and stuff, and then I met Doug. And um, remember, I, I was talking about um, we going to Maui and the hurricane and all that, right? That was coming, and was heading straight for Maui like that. Well, that morning, by, as the Lord led us there through just opening certain doors, we ended up in, um, in Maui, right where the hurricane was heading right for. And that morning, and we had a session, and talking about how the enemy captures Neshma and uses iniquity to empower it. Um, we had a powerful time um, in, in a deliverance session, and something seriously broke that morning. And it's interesting, she sensed the same thing, that she started spinning like this too. So that was dealt with too. And when we broke it, now this is warfare on like, you know, <laughs> on another level. Um, Doug said, it'll be really interesting to see what happens with that hurricane heading to you guys now. And right after that, right from Maui, and it just fell apart. Yeah, Lane, remember Hurricane Lane? Yeah, remember that morning? Yeah, we were actually there in Maui, and it was heading to Kihei, right? And he was sharing how the Lord uses um, the, the Neshma to empower these captured Neshma. Well, the, if I remember correctly, an aspect of our Neshma captured in death was in the eye of the storm. So yes. we called out that. That's right. The satanically driven, because remember, Satan uh, uh, was able to bring a tornado, right? Right. So we, so we call out of that domain any life essence captured, and it was just, it, it, technically, what happened is angels released a bunch of wind shears and broke up the whole thing, and it just diffused. Yeah. And it was gone by that afternoon. Yeah. It was falling apart. I mean, this is like for real. This is not science fiction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, and then the news report earlier said the head got cut off. And that's what we were... When we prayed, decapitate, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you need to thank them too because we could have been in a category what? <laughs> but here's the bonus. That life essence that was in the eye of the storm is here now. That's right. He, we called it back. Yeah. And that was a major, major breakthrough. We, I mean, we could feel it shift. Yeah, literally. Anyway, so Father, thank you as we rest in you. What a full morning. Thank you again for our victory in the Supreme Court, Lord. And thank you for the victories that you're getting here today. Continue to open our eyes, lift off our blinders, Lord. And um, yeah, reveal truth, Holy Spirit. Re reveal what's true so that we can, um, yeah, we can work along with you, Lord, and even into these areas. Thank you for our speakers. Continue to refresh them and empower them and protect them, Lord. Okay, love.